This lecture is on fibropathies, and that's a pathological term which describes diseases which have abnormal fiber structure and which the pathologist can confirm or evaluate by microscopic examination or examination with other advanced techniques. I'm going to apply the fibropathy concept to the uh, general problem of Morgellons disease or Morgellons disease, depends on how you pronounce it. Um, I am going to, uh, as a preview for what the collection will cover, uh, mention first that we'll be describing fibers, and you'll probably ask what fibers. There are um, numerous fibers that are identified in the literature, and uh, they are a puzzle for everyone who deals with them. Um, We'll uh, ask the question, what is the evidence for the composition of the fibers? Uh, that will be probed in this presentation. Uh, we we'll want to ask, what is the site of manufacture of the fibers? Uh, are there models in animal and plant diseases where fibers uh, which are overproduced can cause problems and cause pathologies which have been identified, studied, and figured out? So we'll be looking at models from the animal and plant kingdom for fibropathies in those life forms. Human infections which produce fibers uh, will have two models that will be discussed in detail. The first is the amyloid model, and there are many diseases that produce amyloid. We'll cover a few of them. Uh, amyloid is not one, uh, but many chemical structures and amyloid diseases cover a wide spectrum from endocrine diseases to chronic infections, to neurodegenerative diseases, and to uh, mad cow disease. So uh, we will have uh, just a quick survey of the different types of amyloids that are known. These are all fibers that are produced, uh, and uh, the abnormal fibers which, which are produced cause trouble in the host. Then we'll adapt the amyloid model to cellulose, uh, cellulose fiber production in plants which cause disease and then see if we can make a bridge between what happens in plants and what might be happening in the Morgellons fibers in the human. Because the origin of Morgellons fibers is kind of contentious, uh, it is unknown, uh, and uh, it needs to be figured out so that we can move forward in care of these patients and understanding what their disease challenges are. We have some DNA proof uh, from studies that have been done that microbes uh, specifically agrobacterium microbes, play an important role in Morgellons diseases. Um, we would like to uh, take that a little further uh, and see what the ancillary uh, roles are for Morgellons and uh, fibers uh, from the uh, agrobacterium uh, cellulose um, producer. Uh, agrobacterium is a plant uh, pathogen that uh, is found worldwide it lives in the soil and if it is introduced into the human skin I believe it can produce cellulose in humans just as it produces an overabundance of cellulose in plant diseases where it, it gets in through injury to the plant. Uh, the question uh, we'll cover very briefly in a, a sidelong uh, quick view is uh, what role there might be for microfilaria which we know are carried by ticks uh, other worms, uh, meiasis, uh, and what is the role of insect activity in the uh, events leading up to Morgellons disease. And finally, briefly, we'll cover transfection, uh, which is a concept in which uh, DNA from one uh, life form is inserted into another life form, and uh, it is there permanently as long as the cell is alive, the DNA from the transfer uh, of uh, DNA from one life form to another form, uh, such as bacterial to human or bacterial to plant, transfection event, uh, how that uh, bridges uh, the um, uh, time between uh, entry of the bacterial pathogen into a living system and the production of disease or, or underlying diseases which contribute uh, to such an event. Uh, the um, task we have uh, requires that we have a, uh, an optimistic view 
and a wide open mind. And uh, we uh, look to the Kennedys, uh, Edward M. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, JFK, and ultimately George Bernard Shaw, who wrote these words, some men see things as they are and ask why. And then the rest of it is, uh, according to Shaw, you see things and say why, but I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? Uh, we have to uh, be prepared to adopt this mentality if we're going to make any progress at all in understanding uh, some of the new concepts that are important in Morgellons' disease. In the play, uh, these words were spoken by the serpent uh, to Eve. Uh, President Kennedy quoted them in his address in Ireland in 1963. Of course, Robert Kennedy used it in his uh, uh, election campaign, and Edward Kennedy used uh, those words to eulogize his, uh, his fallen brother. Uh, these uh, words, uh, well, I dreamed of things that never were and asked why not, are not really uh, serpentine uh, Bolshevik type words. These are words uh, that are uh, emboldening uh, the creative process, the open mind, and the ability to uh, grasp new concepts in uh, biology and medicine to solve human problems and to better diagnose and take care of human patients. Um, I'm next going to go uh, quickly with the trust and verify. Uh, you know this uh, dichotomy of words, trust but verify, was used in the Reagan administration when they were doing the disarmament negotiations with the Soviet Union. And uh, between trust and ver uh, uh, verification uh, was the implicit uh, validation term, and validation uh, is uh, the process of checking the facts. Uh, when we first uh, encounter Mark Allen's patient, we uh, take a patient history, we underwritten the case report. Uh, since it's only one case we've ever seen, our first case is anecdotal. Anecdotal evidence is not trusted in uh, academic medicine. So a single case, a single laboratory analysis uh, may be uh, thrown off to be uh, not uh, significant. Many very important discoveries in medicine began with anecdotal uh, reports. For instance, Alzheimer, in his original uh, description of the disease which bears his name, only fully described one case and maybe a second during his entire lifetime. So you could treat uh, Alzheimer's uh, work as anecdotal. However, Alzheimer's work has become a major public health problem and it is anything but anecdotal uh, as a worldwide public health problem. Uh, as you accumulate experience, uh, you'll, recover, you'll cover multiple cases with similar findings. You'll collect these multiple case reports, put them together, with multiple laboratory analysis and then draw better conclusions about what might be going on with the patient and with the disease. Now, theoreticals uh, in fiber type human disease are um, something that we have to deal with and uh, we will deal with the theoreticals and then we will use analysis to further evaluate uh, where the theoreticals take us. So, some fibers may be of external origin, fibers from the environment such as asbestos, when asbestos gets into the body, it produces disease. Some fibers that produce disease in man are produced by the human body. Amyloids are such an example, and they're often produced according to a variety of stimulus uh, factors, some uh, in chronic infection, uh, some in uh, neurodegeneration, some just due to uh, the spontaneous ability of the precursors of amyloid to spontaneously get together, aggregate, stack up like poker chips, and produce a fibril. Fibril then produces disease in the body. Morgellons is all about fibrils. So uh, to the right of this slide, as shown in color, the political backslash uh, science uh, status in traffic light form with red and uh, green lights, uh, yellow lights, and uh, black boxes. Uh, so the first uh, box uh, category is properties of Morgellons fibers. Uh, this is contentious, and uh, there are various reports with various opinions about what is in the McDonald's fibers. Are they hair? Are they uh, introduced by the patient uh, because the patient has a psychiatric illness and uh, the patient introduces uh, man-made uh, synthetic fibers into the skin? Uh, are they produced in the skin spontaneously as a result of bacterial infection? Uh, and are, are they uh, actually cellulose fibers? The number of fibers is uh, more or less a green light category because we know that in some patients fibers are few and in others fibers are many. Some are small, some are large. Uh, they do vary in size. At the eyeball level and at the microscopic level, they will have differences too. The anatomic sites of the fibrils, uh, we can use a green light for that because we know that 
They will accumulate in the skin. They don't uh, appear in the gastrointestinal tract or in the brain or the lung. So anatomically, we're dealing with a skin condition. Microscopically, there's a yellow light because various microscopic uh, techniques are used to analyze uh, Morgellons fibers uh, with varying degrees of precision and success. Uh, the light microscope, the, the uh, polarizing microscope, the fluorescence microscope, and uh, the electron microscope will all be used uh, to try to characterize what the fibers really are all about. Chemical analysis, likewise, has been attempted. Uh, but hasn't been done in a very uh, rigorous uh, FBI type uh, controlled manner. So uh, we have a yellow light for chemical analysis of Magellan's fibers, and we need to work on that. The last uh, four categories, most likely origin of fibers, uh, arbitration about uh, where uh, these uh, theories may take us, validation studies uh, to eliminate uh, further disputes and ratification consensus among all parties, those are black boxes which need to be turned green when we fully understand the Morgellons uh, conundrum. So the first order of forensics uh, uh, is to rule out man-made fibers. Uh, these uh, factitious origin uh, fibers, if they are present in the body, were not produced in the body, but man-made fibers may enter the body uh, in a variety of ways. And uh, when they're recovered from the body, they're uh, evaluated by forensic science. Uh, I've done for 800 forensic autopsies to the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in New York, and I have some familiarity with forensic science and I have great respect for forensic science. When we pass the fibers through the eye of the needle, as you see down here, they must pass rigorous tests, and they must be tested in a way which is reproducible and which is re, uh, reproducible in uh, labs across the world so that uh, a result at, from a uh, lab in California would turn up similar results for uh, the Washington DC or Monaco uh, FBI lab or for laboratories in uh, Europe or Eur Eurasia. All of the laboratory results, if done according to a protocol that is agreed upon, should turn up uh, similar results for hemodynamic fibers. And we should not have a wide uh, number of um, possible uh, origins or possible compositions of Magellan's fibers to have to worry about. Uh, intervention is necessary uh, here to do the forensic work and we submit fibers to a forensic fiber identification laboratory for definitive classification. Now forensic labs are different from hospital labs because they have specialized equipment and they have specialized uh, highly trained technologists and uh, doctors that work uh, only on fiber analysis and have great experience. Uh, ordinary pathologists do not have such experience and uh, people um, who are not trained in forensic science uh, should not attempt to do forensic level uh, investigation. They merely muddy uh, the water. Uh, the premier fiber analysis uh, laboratory in the world is an FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. It's also called the Trace Analysis Laboratory. Uh, they do fiber analysis uh, in a supremely uh, excellent way. Uh, they certify other laboratories around the country to uh, repeat the type of work that they do and to outfit them with the type of equipment that they use. They certify uh, the people who work in the lab, they certify the lab, they challenge the lab with unknown specimens and see if they get the test correctly. Uh, they uh, work on standardization so that all people who do fiber work standardize it and do it in the same way. Uh, they use controls uh, for each of their fiber analysis uh, studies. Uh, they have access to computer banks so they can go back and look at the fiber analysis work that was done in previous cases and compare the uh, results of analysis on any fiber with their computer data bank uh, to reach a very good diagnosis. And finally, they issue written reports, which are admissible in courts of law as evidence in front of criminal prosecutions or uh, in other types of work. Um, the evidence that is uh, presented is then uh, sometimes the basis for benign, uh, I mean, uh, guilty or malignant uh, uh, verdicts and juries. Multiple fibers in a single specimen may influence conclusions about origins which are unique to the patient body. Uh, so if we find that there are four or five different types of fiber, uh, fibers within a body site, uh, we do wonder uh, whether uh, the patient was exposed to a unique environment where all of those fibers would be simultaneously deposited or whether over a lifetime the uh, patient was exposed by work or uh, by uh, residence to multiple fiber types that wound up in the body and caused trouble. 
Uh, Magellan fibers, I think, at this point, we can clearly say are uh, of one type. We just have to decide what the name of the composition is and to agree upon it. Fibers collected from uh, the uh, crime scenes by police uh, undergo a chain of evidence, and that is that they are uh, placed in special containers, uh, carefully labeled uh, the police wear gloves, and uh, each time the um, evidence is transferred from uh, one police uh, official to another, uh, there is a sign, a sign sheet, and uh, it's what called it's what is called a chain of evidence. So that there's no opportunity to contaminate or to pollute uh, the evidence, which is the fiber, on its way to the laboratory. Chain of evidence is imperative, imperative and must be followed in uh, first-class fiber investigations to make sure that the fibers, uh, the fiber results that are reported by the lab, reflect 100% the uh, fiber that was uh, found at the scene either in the tissue of the patient, as we do with my gowns, or at a crime scene where they find uh, rug fibers or hair fibers or other animal fibers uh, in connection with the crime scene. So chain of evidence is what we um, want to follow when we uh, collect the gallons fibers and then submit them to a reference laboratory. Uh, trace analysis is done by the uh, Chronicle Lab in Virginia by the FBI, as I said before, and other approved uh, national laboratories state and government agencies and private analytical laboratories have FBI level certification after they have been trained and approved and tested and retested uh, and validated by the uh, central lab of the FBI and Quantic Club. Attaining fiber analysis FBI level certification is a uh, special special category uh, not attained by most labs and uh, when attained uh, they work hard to uh, keep it and they do not surrender it. So it's a lot of work, a lot of expense for laboratory equipment, and a lot of time. Training programs are necessary to um, get uh, the technologists up to speed and specialized laboratory equipment for state-of-the-art fiber analysis are necessary to do this work. Online databases are uh, available through limited access of uh, computer data banks to uh, certified laboratories for a storage of fiber-specific data sets, and then these are used to uh, connect uh, data for new fiber analysis cases and to reach a very good diagnosis. Forensic backtracking is possible when the site of manufacture uh, is a question, and sometimes the fibers that are recovered uh, with uh, detail analysis will enable the back FBI to backtrack to the uh, factory or the site, the country or site in the world where manufactured fibers were produced. So this is the level of fingerprint type analysis that is available uh, to the law enforcement and to the uh, people in the scientific community. Hair analysis and other fibers contained within uh, human bodies may be uh, analyzed for racial features, presence of heavy metals, and then most important, DNA from the hair bulb that's available can be extracted and it can be used to link a hair fiber to a victim or to a perpetrator. So DNA analysis is part of hair analysis. Man-made synthetic or modified uh, fibers are also analyzed in great detail and can, uh, can be uh, classified in exquisite detail. So fingerprint analysis uh, by the FBI type labs uh, has exquisite uh, uh, ability to determine the uniqueness of the fibers or a relationship with these to other previously described and analyzed fibers. Uh, we're going to start with rigid fibers. Uh, here we have glass, asbestos, and uh, other rigid fibers. Uh, they may be found in the body. Uh, asbestos is one of the rigid fibers, and we see coarse asbestos particles. Uh, asbestos diseases uh, can include uh, lung diseases such as fibrosis and, unfortunately, uh, mesothelioma or other cancers. Uh, so asbestos is a bad player. When it gets, when it gets into the body, it is uh, potentially a, a life-threatening uh, fibropathy. Uh, the smaller fibers of asbestos are shown here. These are not as big as the ones I just showed you, but they're called amosite fibers, and they're seen under the electron microscope. Uh, they're just as dangerous. Uh, they're more likely to be inhaled into the deep lung areas, and uh, they're rigid fibers. Uh, they may be found in the skin. Uh, also, what may be found in the skin are uh, ceramic glass fibers, here from an art school, and you can see that there are brown, rounded areas on the fiber, which uh, are um, extra deposits uh, from the uh, ceramic glass material. 
biological fibers are flexible and non-rigid. Uh, uh, we need reproducible fiber analysis data sets from case to case to characterize biological fibers. Uh, not qualified, uh, not invited to the fiber analysis party, you might say, for state-of-the-art FBI-type fiber analysis uh, are the following. Number one is crushing fibers. Some people with um, more gallons cases have sent them to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. This is not a certified FBI-level fiber analysis lab. The, F, uh, the AFIP, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, uh, tried crushing the fibers and doing some other investigations which are not state-of-the-art, and uh, so their report really was not contributory to what the fibers might be or might not be. Other laboratories, such as high school labs, might try burning the fibers and see at what temperature the fibers melt or catch fire or whether they don't burn at all, like asbestos would not burn at all. Uh, attempt, chemical extractions from fibers may be attempted by commercial laboratories. And that would be to try to make something solid into a solution and then analyze the uh, chemical constituents in the solution. Uh, that's not part of the usual FBI level fiber analysis either. So controls in fiber analysis are uh, what we need to follow. They're distributed by national laboratories to maintain uniformity of forensic fiber identification. You must use controls in every laboratory procedure that is done correctly. Controls and laboratory science go together uh, and are uh, hinged at the, at the hip. Uh, they cannot be separated. You have a bad laboratory practice if you do not have controls in your laboratory. Um, man, the engineered modified biological fibers include cellulose, and many modifications of cellulose, cotton, uh, and maybe mercerized cotton, and many other modifications, linen, bamboo, and hemp also have many modifications that are introduced in factories to make them either stronger or softer or silkier, and uh, fibers can be manipulated by an uh, industrial manufacturer to uh, the properties of the design and uh, desired by the manufacturer. Uh, now, this uh, slide shows the effect on uh, cellulose fibers and curly fibers, which are amyloid fibers, uh, and the effect of temperature. So, note on the bottom panel, uh, the uh, cultures were uh, done at 28 degrees centigrade, which is almost room temperature, and in the upper panel at 37 degrees centigrade, which is uh, body temperature. You can see the, the same fibers uh, in various uh, genetic uh, mutants assume uh, very different uh, those microscopic appearances, particularly the cellulose fiber uh, to the far right uh, at 28 degrees looks nothing like the cellulose fiber in the same uh, genetic um, preparation uh, grown at 37 degrees. So fibers that are grown in the body will look different from fibers that are grown at room temperature. And there are many reasons for this, but they involve the complex chemistry of fiber formation. And we have to keep this in mind when we think about uh, more gallons fibers, which if produced by the body, would be produced at body temperature, 37 degrees. And if we try to compare them with fibers that were prepared at room temperature, we might not get a good match. So we have to keep an open mind about temperature, pH, ionic strength, the uh, presence of other chemicals in the environment, presence or absence of metals, and uh, other competing uh, proteins uh, in the area where the fiber is being produced, which may modify the ultimate final structure of the fiber. So what we have from manufacture may not match what is uh, present when the fiber is produced inside the body, as is shown here. 28 degrees is a big difference between 37 degrees, and the fibers look different. Now, in cellulose, we have thick, thin, woven, webbed variants, and uh, they're all shown here in like a spaghetti array. Uh, these are cellulose uh, fiber diversities, uh, and they are a result of uh, the way the fibers polymerize or aggregate or come together to form something that is not microscopic, but something that's visible to the naked eye. And you can see that there are thin fibers, there are wide, flat fibers, there are intertwined fibers, and there are um, branched or webbed fibers. Electron microscopy has a place. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have a first-class place in fiber analysis, and there have been a fair number of electron microscopic examinations to try to classify and diagnose Morgellons fibers. 
Uh, electron microscopy is not used by the FBI, and I do not think electron microscopy is uh, helpful except to exclude uh, other types of fibers, man-made fibers, or animal hair fibers, for instance, that uh, have a specific electron microscopic appearance. Um, scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy are great for hospital diagnosis of rare conditions, and we use them all the time. They should not be used as first uh, line for fiber analysis. Here's an example of how a, uh, an electron microscope would show us uh, the problem in a uh, muscle disease, a myopathy. This uh, shows congenital cytoplasmic body myopathy uh, between the uh, three yellow arrows. And to the far right, you see what normal skeletal muscle looks like. So the fiber that's diseased has an inclusion. It can be seen with the electron microscopy study, and that inclusion tells us what the nature of the disease is. So it clinches the diagnosis of many obscure diseases. This is not helpful in Morgellons disease. Electron microscopy here for nemaline myopathy, another muscle disease, shows red inclusions which are uh, present in muscle and which interfere with the sarcoplasmic uh, sarcomere uh, architecture and the ability of the muscles to work uh, to produce uh, tension. Again, electron microscopy coming to the aid of a diagnosis of an obscure muscle disease. Morgellons disease need not apply. Uh, EM is not going to help us in Morgellons disease. Uh, here's another example of a muscle uh, fibropathy, and that is the ragged red uh, muscle fibers, ragged red muscle fiber disease, and you can see the red uh, fibers in the uh, panel, which are surrounded by normal healthy muscle cells, which are gray to blue. Uh, straightforward diagnosis. One picture makes a diagnosis and you're on to the next case. There are controls for this, uh, and there is a, uh, a basis for making a diagnosis using the electron microscopy study in this muscle disease. Um, Morgellons disease need not apply uh, with electron microscopic validation or verification. Histochemistry has a place. So that's staining, special stains. It's in, in commercial labs, hospital labs, they use melanin stains, they use uh, cyberterrorism stains. Uh, and they uh, determine the pattern by histochemistry of how the stains bind to the target. Uh, in amyloid, uh, congo red stains, thioflavin stains, or even immunostains have done to further characterize the amyloid. So histochemistry has a place for uh, diagnosis of fibers, uh, keratin fibers, or amyloid fibers. Um, I'm not sure that histochemistry now has a place in Morgellons fibers. Uh, cytokeratins have both low molecular weight types and high molecular weight types, and there are reagents specific for low molecular weight that exclude high molecular weight and vice versa. So you can use cytochemistry to help you classify cytokeratins if the fibers in Morgellons disease came from the hair apparatus. They would be cytokeratin positive because keratin is the stuff that makes hair, and uh, so we must. Uh, read about uh, what the study was uh, uh, revealing and uh, then a factor in uh, whether the uh, fiber that was studied was a naturally produced hair or a diseased Morgellon fiber. They may coexist in the same specimen and you may sample hair when you really want to sample the Morgellon fiber. So hair analysis has a place and it may be tempted uh, from any lab from high school to commercial labs. You can determine human hair versus non-human hair and uh, make a pretty good diagnosis if you're trained and you have resources of the FBI uh, type laboratory. Uh, here's a uh, group, uh, cartoon of a hair unit with a hair bulb, a hair follicle, and the sebaceous glands, uh, oil glands, uh, the overlying skin, and uh, the hair itself coming out through the skin. Uh, this is the normal architecture of human hair. Uh, also present, of course, are other glands, sweat glands are important. There's fat, there's muscle. Uh, there's keratin uh, tissue, such as uh, what is in the skin overlying the epidermis. There's connective tissue, there's elastic fibers, uh, and there are fibroblasts. So many, many things to consider in the skin. Within a hair, uh, there can be a split of finer and finer and finer. So moving from right to left, you can see the whole hair. And then as you dissect out pieces smaller and smaller and smaller, you get to a right-handed alpha helix. Uh, later at your leisure, you can study this diagram and see how 
the different units interact and come together as components to form the normal mature human hair. Uh, we want to diagnose Morpellon's disease with bulletproof certainty, diagnostic certainty at the bulletproof level. So uh, I call this the Kevlar model, and since I mentioned Kevlar, I might as well talk to you about what Kevlar looks like. Uh, it was uh, newer, stronger fibers uh, accidentally discovered uh, in the laboratory accident. Uh, it's now used to, as you know, to prepare bulletproof uh, materials for our troops. Uh, and uh, I'll mention as a side light, the spiderweb fibers are uh, almost as strong or as strong as Kevlar fibers, uh, but they are produced naturally. Uh, this is the Kevlar uh, product, uh, the bulletproof uh, armor, body armor pre prepared for our troops. And this is what they look like under the microscope. They're pretty homogeneous. Uh, they um, have a uh, uniformity to them. Uh, you don't see any uh, subcompartments, wrinkles, uh, twists, uh, or uh, bumps. Uh, they're very, very uniform. And uh, chemically, they come from uh, uh, an amalgamation of uh, specific organic molecules which are connected by peptide bonds and uh, hydrogen bonds to produce the incredibly strong Kevlar fiber. Uh, abnormal uh, biological fibers now will be uh, our topic and amyloids will be first. Uh, there are many types of amyloids. We'll briefly talk about kinky hair disease. That's a single disease due to a genetic mutation. And we'll talk about keloid fibers which are a problem for people of color um, they all have different fiber properties, and uh, they have uh, different uh, lessons to be learned. Amyloid is a present in Alzheimer's plaques, and uh, it's a type of amyloid called beta-42. Here you see the brown areas are amyloid areas within the brain. Those are the Alzheimer's plaques, and the areas not taking brown stain are brain tissue not um, damaged by amyloid plaques or Alzheimer's plaques. So it is a fiberopathy in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. The fiber is amyloid beta-42. And take a very uh, higher view, you'll see that each plaque has an amyloid core, uh, which is dead center, like the bullseye, and it has a ring of uh, brown uh, amyloid around the edge. And the amyloid uh, is in the process of, at the edge of the circle, uh, choking off and uh, surrounding and incorporating healthy brain cells as it moves outward from its central core. So it's a fiberopathy, amyloid disease, and Alzheimer's disease, a fiberopathy. Here is amyloid, uh, but it's uh, from bovine insulin. So insulin, under certain circumstances, can produce amyloid by uh, producing either round uh, uh, bodies, uh, and then those bodies become uh, elongated, uh, thread-like, or uh, twisted. And, uh, bigger fibers, and uh, spherical formation is what's seen first, those are the little round circles, and then the longer fibers are smart in second. Uh, diabetics and other people with endocrine diseases may produce endocrine-type amyloid, and uh, the reason for this is not clear, but uh, it is related to an imbalance of chemical production of the precursor substance, which then goes on to form amyloid. Amyloid chemically from the insulin that we see here is completely different biochemically if you digest it down from the amyloid which is produced in Alzheimer's disease. So they're different chemical entities but they have the same name and uh, that's a little confusing for people to get used to. Uh, one of the properties that we uh, learned from amyloid is that this fiberopathy um, develops from little minute uh, chemical uh, elements which then self-associate or self-polymerize. And uh, as you move down uh, column B from the top to the bottom, you'll see that the purple uh, zigzags become stacked like poker chips and they become elongated. So the amyloid fiber formation is a result of spontaneous uh, aggregation, self-association of the chemical agents which produce the fiber. And there's no assembly line needed. There's no uh, machines, uh, there are no uh, assembly line workers. The fibers <coughs> produce um, by self association or self aggregation. This lesson in fiber apathies is extremely important. Uh, fibers that are able to produce diseases in plant and animal kingdom have this overall ability 
to form from nothing. They form from single units that attach to or another unit that they find that matches them, and then they stack like poker chips, and eventually they become a fiber, which you can see. So self-association means that if you have a production uh, in a bacterium, for instance, and the bacterium is sending off small chemicals at its surface, over time these will stack together, and over a longer time they will form fibers that you can see with a naked eye. So bacteria can be the source of fibropathies. This is another example of how amyloid forms form poker chips. We won't go into all the chemistry here, but the lesson is that the precursor or the starting chemical unit is found in a healthy cell and that under conditions of disease, abnormal enzyme activity, or mutations, uh, you develop uh, the self-aggregation, the self-assembly, and then you have the poker chips on the right-hand side, which are the amyloid fibers. Uh, these are the way the disease produces. Now, when the fibers collect, they deposit in the tissues, and on the uh, left panel, you can see amyloid deposits, uh, which are the gray, uh, blue, uh, that are spreading apart the healthy muscle fibers, which are pink. And because the amyloid is fairly rigid and uh, not able to contract like muscle cells, the heart muscle isn't able to uh, beat as strongly, and uh, the uh, patient develops heart failure because the amyloid burdens the heart pumping muscle activity. Under the microscope, you can see that amyloid fibers have uh, a little more organization uh, than we saw on a previous uh, slide. Uh, and uh, these are fibrils that may be twisted into large ropes or small ropes uh, and they intersect. And they are organized into a pattern which is usually called a beta pleated sheet of uh, fibers. Here's another example of the poker chip orientation for amyloid fibers. The stacking, you can see uh, in the uh, color panel beta sheet stacking, and you can see more of the uh, chemistry details uh, associated with that stacking. Stacking is part of the self association, and one fiber sits on top of the other in a specific orientation, and they continue to form higher and higher, larger and larger stacks until they form visible fibers. So it's an amyloid fibropathy. Uh, this again shows uh, another schematic of how a cell produces a precursor protein, and then that protein under certain circumstances will self-associate and then form a visible amyloid fiber if disease is present and if the uh, conditions are correct. You can take a, um, a mold, uh, a yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, put it in a test tube and grow amyloid fibers because the, uh, the bug uh, has the ability to produce amyloid from its surface. So uh, here we have uh, in the color panel of the uh, multicolored uh, orange, uh, yellow, green strands. Those are uh, amyloid produced from a yeast or uh, fungus. Uh, and other bacteria can do the same thing. So the bacteria have only the machinery to produce amyloid fibers. And one of the things that we know about chronic infections is that amyloid is part of what we see in chronic infection tissue. And it is a representation partly of the body's response to the infection and partly of the ability of certain bugs to produce amyloid precursors, which then stack together like poker chips and take up space and compromise the function of the organ that they are invading. Um, to the uh, left, we see a healthy state where amyloid fibers are not being formed, and we see to the right the growth phase where amyloid fibers are being formed. And what uh, causes the trip over from normal, no fibers, to disease with fibers is not completely known for all diseases, but we know that amyloid fibers form through self-assembly or self-aggregation. There's no enzyme needed to make these fibers grow. There is no other condition needed to make these fibers grow. All you need to do is produce enough of them and they'll stack like poker chips and form an amyloid fiber which then will cause disease or a health condition. It's a fiber apathy of the amyloid type. Uh, the mad cow uh, disease patients also produce amyloid and that's, that's sort of a uh, a puzzle because uh, the amyloid 
uh, that is produced uh, by the mad cow disease uh, brain is different from the amyloid that's produced by the Alzheimer brain. And uh, quite simply, uh, the, the way the uh, uh, stacking of the chips goes is uh, subdivided into alpha, uh, alpha structure or beta sheets. And uh, the uh, misfolded fibers in mad cow disease are alpha sheet misfolds, and the misfolded fibers in Alzheimer's disease are beta sheet misfolds. Infection is beta sheet misfolds. So alpha sheet misfolds may be more toxic uh, to the body than beta sheet misfolds are. We don't know for sure, but they are different, and they're different because the chemistry is different. They form by self aggregation. Now, uh, what gets mad cow disease going is uh, unknown, it's scary, because there is no cure for mad cow disease. But we know that there's an amyloid component associated with it. It's a fiber opposite, just like Alzheimer's. Other brain diseases are also part of the fiber apathy neurodegenerative spectrum. They include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's chorea, Lou Gehrig's disease, and frontotemporal dementia. They all show to one degree or, or another thoughtropathies or aggregations of pathologic fibers which self-assemble and which take up space in the disease organ, usually the brain or spinal cord, and cause disease by pushing apart healthy cells and by interfering with the correct communication between uh, healthy uh, cells in uh, the brain, a fibropathy amyloid. Uh, we're going to now consider uh, a type of fiber which is uh, a special case of due to a genetic disease it's called the kinky hair disease fiber. And uh, these uh, unfortunate infants are born with a genetic mutation or a series of mutations. Uh, you can um, immediately recognize that they have very poor muscle tone here. They, they have a floppy baby uh, with no muscle tone. And uh, looking at the hair, uh, you can see that the hair is kinky. Uh, there is a uh, twisting of it, and uh, you can see at the arrow, there's a structure called a pili of a torti. That's abnormal formation in the hair. Uh, the center part of the hair is also abnormal. And uh, this is from the scalp, and you can see some more of the kinky hair disease. Another fiber apathy, but this is an inherited one. And this one comes from the hair shaft. So the hair shaft, because of poor uh, genetic uh, uh, inheritance, is producing hair fibers that are not normal. Well, there are other abnormalities in the body, um, but uh, you can see the polarized light that the kinky hair is uh, showing a kinky sort of refractile pattern. And when you break the fibers apart, uh, there is a spontaneous uh, explosion of the uh, fibrils into smaller and smaller parts uh, in uh, this disease. It's also called Mikey's and the NKES disease, kinky hair disease. There's an abnormality of fibers in the brain. and uh, fibers in the muscle, so uh, this shows an abnormal fiber arrangement in the brain in kinky hair disease. Uh, the central region of kinky hair disease shows this sort of uh, pattern, which is not normal, for a hair shaft, and it's uh, almost like a spiral uh, instead of a straight line uh, in the center of the kinky hair shaft itself. Keloid fibers are uh, very pink, um, fibers that are shown here. Uh, the only uh, pink-red uh, structures that you see are keloid fibers. It's an abnormal reaction of uh, skin to trauma. And people of color often are troubled by keloids. Um, some people, uh, Caucasians, also, also have keloid tendencies. It's an abnormal uh, wound reaction. The skin reacts in an abnormal way. It forms large fibers. And these fibers come together to form tumors. Uh, which are benign but unsightly, and when you try to remove them, uh, you've got a keloid growing back at the site where you try to remove because surgery was a trauma. So the uh, keloid uh, um, cosmetic issue is a considerable one, and uh, plastic surgery cannot uh, deal with it because the more surgery, the more keloids. Every time you cut into the skin, you've got a new keloid. This is the large keloid of the external ear. And this is another view of the keloid fiber formation in the skin. These fibers do not uh, come out of the skin in a type of fiber which you can roll between your fingers and look like uh, uh, bristles of a brush. These are fibers that are uh, in the skin. Uh, they do not separate from one another like uh, asbestos fibers do. 
Uh, and uh, so they're sort of, sort of closer to uh, an exaggerated, an abnormal pattern of uh, skin healing by the fibroblasts in the skin, uh, but you're producing an abnormal form of scar tissue. So keloid fibers, uh, not that you can pluck it with tweezers, but real and a problem for some patients, another fibropathy. Animal diseases with abnormal biological fibers are investigated in veterinary academic research labs, and uh, mange is uh, what we're going to be looking at now. Mange is uh, a question, is it a fibropathy or is it something else? A uh, hair shaft in uh, animals may be parasitized uh, by uh, either demodex parasites or sarcoptic um, parasites, and they produce different types of mange. Uh, demodex is a uh, parasite that goes for the uh, sebaceous glands and the sarcoptic uh, mange uh, goes for other parts of the hair shaft. And uh, the result of mange is that the hair that is damaged is lost. And then the, pa the, uh, the patient, which is the dog, undergoes un unpleasant and uh, cosmetically uh, very, very disturbing appearance with loss of hair. Uh, the hair shafts are lost, but there are no fibropathies here. Uh, it is purely loss of hair due to parasites. Uh, here is a demodex parasite to the far left, uh, and that goes into the sweat glands and then works to destroy the uh, hair uh, production, and the animal loses hair in that area. You can cure the infection uh, uh, thankfully, and uh, when diagnosed, uh, they can be cured. Um, usually, the mange is not a, a condition which is transmissible from your pet to you, uh, so it's a pet specific uh, condition that uh, involves a hair shaft but does not produce the types of fibers that we see in Morgellons disease. This is the sarcoptic mange, and this is what the little scabies like sarcoptic uh, parasite looks like. Uh, and uh, that's another type of mange which is present in animals that can be cured. Uh, animals are uh, not going to transmit this to uh, humans. Now there is a uh, puzzle uh, in, uh, in the North Slope uh, uh, off of uh, Alaska and uh, Canada and it was that certain seals are coming in with a hair loss, a mangy type uh, illness and they haven't really figured out what's going on here with these animals. Uh, but uh, they have hair and skin lesions, and uh, they are uh, uh, being studied in Canada at this time. They don't really know what the uh, cause of this is, or whether it is uh, uh, related to something like a uh, parasite uh, of uh, the dog-type mages or not. Now we're going to talk about plants, and plants have fibroapathies too. Uh, gall disease in plants is a disease where plants develop uh, great big round tumor-like bumps along their uh, stalks, their trunks, their branches, their roots, their leaves. And uh, trauma begins when uh, some sort of uh, injury occurs to the bark and then bacteria enter the plant structure. The bacteria cause tumor-like swellings on the plant surface by producing new cellulose fibers, so here's our fibropathy, and by producing new plant cells. And altogether the um, mass of new material, cellulose fibers and new uh, plant cells, uh, distort uh, the, uh, the stem of the plant and calls, these are called gall lesions. So gall lesions are present in many, many plants and are an agricultural problem in many parts of the world. Terrestrial plants with abnormal uh, fibers are studied in uh, botany labs. Here's an example of agrobacterium causing a uh, gall lesion in a plant. You can see how unsightly it is. This is all due to overproduction of cellulose fibers by the bacteria that invaded the plant. So by pruning the plant or by injuring the plant or insects chewing away at the bark, the bacteria gain access. Bacteria present in the soil, agrobacteria is present everywhere. Once it gets inside the plant, it starts making its fiber, which is cellulose, and then the cellulose causes these big bumps. So this is called the agrobacterium in the plant. Uh, this is a second type of injury. Uh, an insect may uh, chew into the uh, bark of the plant and bring along with it the agrobacterium and then it can cause the same sort of unsightly uh, large tumor-like swelling. And a very large example from a tree in Australia uh, caused by agrobacterium in a tree trunk. Uh, uh, this is Austria, I'm sorry, not Australia. 
football due to agrobacterium is then a manifestation of overproduction of fibers. These are cellulose fibers. And the bacteria produces the cellulose fiber on its surface. And then overproduction of uh, plant cells in reaction to the infection, causing this great big swelling and distortion of the branch of the plant. Sometimes there's an insect that's uh, in, in the center of the gall lesion. They cut it in half. They'll find the larvae of a wasp or some other insect. So the insect burrowed into the plant, and as it burrowed along, it carried along the bacteria that caused the overproduction of the cellulose fibers, overproduction of the plant cells, and uh, the insect waits to mature, and then it breaks out of the gall lesion and goes on to a mature form. So insects may produce this. Now, this is a key point. Insects injuring the surface of the living form bring along agrobacterium with them. The agrobacterium, once it gets inside the living organism, uh, thanks to the action of the insect, then produces cellulose fibers. Cellulose fibers produce a mass or produce fibers that are uh, unfavorable for the plant, plant health. There are oceanic diseases uh, which have a similar uh, gall type of situation, and these are, these are called marine galls. And this is one that uh, involves algae, so you see the bumpy nature of the gall lesion in the algae. So, uh, oceanic uh, organisms are present that, uh, like agrobacterium tumefaciens on land, can produce gall lesions in algae. Now, fibers in Morgellons disease, a human condition, um, are associated with hair lungs and with a fiber optic. The fibers we all know about, we see them, we hear about them. They have different colors here, present and sometimes just a scant number, sometimes they're present in a large number. Um, they might be thought of as a fur ball of the skin, but they're not a fur ball because they were produced in the skin of the patient by some process which we haven't really completely characterized or agreed upon. But the process is agreed upon that agrobacterium DNA is present in the areas where Mordellin's fibers are produced. Now, we've already learned that agrobacterium can produce collagen by itself, and therefore, it's plausible to think that the agrobacterium can produce little bits of collagen fibrils, which then, by spontaneous aggregation, combine to get bigger and bigger fibrils, which then become the strands that we see with a naked eye or on dermoscopy. Uh, this is uh, some of the morphology of the Morgellons fibers. They don't all look the same. And remember, fibers that are produced under different chemical situations, different pHs, different temperatures, will have different shapes, different morphologies, different configurations. That's because the stacking process is altered by the environment in which the stacking occurs. So if you have a little more acid in the environment, the fibers that are produced from the bacteria will look different from uh, fibers produced in a basic environment. Uh, this is what the skin lesions look like, and uh, they're unpleasant. Uh, they're uh, sometimes clustered, sometimes confluent, uh, and uh, they are um, in larger uh, uh, lesions, uh, the site of uh, fibers such as this, which under polarized light examination uh, show different colors. Uh, the polarized light is interesting for photographic purposes. Uh, it doesn't tell us a bit about what the composition is. It does not have FBI level certification for fiber analysis. It's a crude example of how we use a microscope to look at fibers. And uh, here we have a side-by-side -side of black fiber and then some clear fibers and black fibers. And uh, these are then uh, heterogeneous types of yellow fibers. Here the fibers are all black, but they're some are thick, some are thin. Uh, they're in a uh, uh, tangle. And uh, at the top there's a hair shaft for comparison. So they may be smaller than a hair shaft. It may be larger than the shaft, as you can see from the diameters in the black area at uh, the uh, left of the uh, image. Uh, they may have uh, twists and turns. They may have things that look sort of like hair bulbs, but really aren't, because they don't have DNA in them. Hair bulbs have DNA. And uh, even more twisted and more convoluted are uh, these Morgellon fibers, uh, which are a little bumpy, uh, some twisted, some turned, they look flat. 
and uh, they have overall properties which to me suggest that they are cellulose uh, polymers that have been subjected to aggregation under slightly different conditions from area to area in the skin, and that's why they look different. They're not all the same, they're not all cookie cutters. Cellulose fiber is produced in nature where the conditions are stable, and all look very, very similar. And if you digest down, 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 you'll see that cellulose is actually chains of glucose molecules. And those glucose molecules then are connected end to end, and they form little fibrils, and then fibrils can become a microfiber, and then they become a macrofiber, and then they become the type of fiber that you see at the far left, which is yellow and flat, and they're fairly uniform. Uh, the plant fibers are produced under conditions where the pH and the uh, other uh, environment uh, is pretty much controlled and uh, is not subject to variation. It's also produced at uh, room temperature, which is uh, or below. Uh, you know, plants do not have a 37 degree temperature. Remember back, uh, 37 degree polymerization produces fibers that are different from polymerization of 28 degrees. So uh, we have to be a little flexible, flexible in interpreting what we have from plant fibers and what we have from uh, cellulose fibers recovered from human skin and more balanced disease. And here again, to repeat that, you see the 28 degree, you see the 37 degree panels, and they look very different. Cellulose fibers then are altered by the temperature at which uh, they are being produced. Uh, here's a, another cartoon showing plant cells with cellulose fibers that are pretty uniform. And uh, you see the glucose uh, subunits uh, down at uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, they're all strung together to make the microfibrils, and then those cellulose uh, become strands that become bigger and bigger and become an actual fiber you can see holding their hand. Now, a national uh, repository of Morgellons fibers in a fiber bank would be a great thing for uh, a society to undertake so that uh, Morgellons fibers from patients in different parts of the country and from around the world could be collected in one central repository and then how uh, they could be analyzed and compared and contrasted. And I recommend that uh, that be considered for a future study. Uh, advanced analysis could then be done uh, using uh, pooled resources on something like this vitrification apparatus, which is a really high-tech machine, would be able to give you a very, some very sophisticated fiber analysis readouts on the Morgellons fibers from the uh, fiber bank material. Um, it's a research opportunity, and central repositories for Morgellons fibers, I think, are a great idea. Uh, we have central banks for diseases like Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis and the various disease where the patient material is deposited in the central repository, and then researchers can uh, access that material and make uh, uh, research investigations based on uh, collection of material from different sources and different patients. And microbiology is important in modelling diseases, and uh, you've heard about microbiology, uh, I think uh, this uh, conference began with that and has probably followed up with uh, other descriptions of uh, Agrobacterium and even the Helicobacter pylori, so we won't be able to go back in the great detail that we've heard with the previous lectures, but uh, this will kind of maybe put some things together that uh, you can consider. Agrobacterium is gram negative modal. It's a soil bacteria that's always present in Magellan's disease. I'll repeat that. Agrobacterium is always present in Magellan's disease. It's a soil bacteria. Now, sometimes it's there for a while. It uses its DNA, transfers its DNA, and then the, the bacterium is lost or killed or died off, but the DNA persists, the DNA stays around. So by doing PCR studies, you can always find that these are um, DNA positive for agrobacterium in Magellan's disease, always, always, always. Uh, it is a family of microbes, and uh, we think of um, three uh, subgroups, there's the tumorphations, which has now been renamed Rhizobium radiobacter, or Agrobacter radiobacter. Uh, it depends on the Latin name that you prefer, but the general category is that it is one um, a microbe. It has uh, some uh, related microbes that uh, tend to uh, attack other roots. Uh, that's the 
Echo Duck Chairman Azogenes, Trisha some disease called hairy root disease, or Sarah uh, Tully, uh, which produces olive knot disease. These are uh, gall like diseases involving roots or olive uh, uh, plants. Other pathogens include Helicobacter. This is a soil, water, and fecal bacteria that has a worldwide distribution and uh, it has recently been discovered in Morgellons uh, uh, tissue specimens from humans. Why it should be outside the stomach and then the skin is at least uh, at first a great uh, concern, conundrum. How, can, how could that be? How could it get out of the stomach and get into the skin? Well, I'll offer a suggestion as to how that might be in a few slides from now, but uh, it is present. Uh, it has been identified. There are um, different strains of Helicobacter around the world, different strains of Agrobacterium, and uh, they uh, may combine to uh, promote fiber uh, formation and skin disease uh, in Morgellons patients. Borrelia, of course, uh, we know now that Borrelia is present microscopically in the milieu where Morgellons fibers are uh, discovered and various species of Borrelia are possible in Morgellons lesions from Borrelia uh, environments around the world. Uh, the Bergdorf Rod group has been the best studied and Dr. Eva Shockey's lab uh, and Dr. Middleton has uh, have, are both uh, done great work in uh, proving, along with Dr. Stricker, that Borrelia uh, Bergdorferi is part of the microbiology uh, environment in which Morgellons disease exists. But uh, unlike Lyme disease, which is uncomplicated, Lyme disease does not have agrobacterium in the lesions. Lyme disease does not have Helicobacter in the lesions. It has Borrelia. It may have Coxiella burnetti and Anaplasma. Uh, it may have Bartonella and have other, other co-infections. But it doesn't have the key uh, agrobacterium group. So Borrelia is uh, there. And why should all three be there in one lesion? Uh, well, uh, this is a quick look at Helicobacter's pylori. Gram-negative, modal, with flagellum, present around the world. Uh, it's present in Africa. And here are the uh, distributions for Helicobacter in Africa and uh, different uh, subtypes of Helicobacter in different parts of Africa. Uh, soil, water, fecal, it's present in uh, the world that we live in. And it's taken, uh, taken up by uh, insects uh, that work uh, walk along the soil. It's taken up by humans who consume food grown in soil and consume it and enter the stomach. Um, this is a Japanese study of water, fly, species, and soil, and soil showing Hippobacter species worldwide distribution. Other um, pathogens that are perhaps related in a significant way to Morgellons are microfilaria, and meiasis. And meiasis are worms uh, that uh, develop from the eggs of flies that lay their eggs in uh, sites like uh, plants and uh, uh, as they hatch, they move around and they grow into mature insects and uh, fly away. Microfilaria are uh, present in the tip gut, uh, and they were seen by Willie Bergdorfer in his initial investigation of Lyme disease, and they are much larger than spirochetes, and uh, they are uh, also a, an unknown at this time in terms of what they might be doing, but uh, it is not too hard to uh, imagine that uh, the creeping sensation that some people feel in their Morgellon skin lesions may be the movement of uh, species such as these agents uh, through the Morgellons mix, the fiber, the Borrelia, the uh, um, Agrobacterium, and the uh, Helicobacter. So we don't know, but we uh, do have a description from Dr. Bergdorfer uh, here uh, from the original Shelter Island study of microfilaria of exceptional size from the next of the tick. And uh, as he was looking at the microfilaria, he saw out of the corner of his eye the Borrelia spirochetes, which are much, much smaller than sting nearly as well. And he made his brilliant discovery of the cause of lung disease from the tick gut. So we have polymicrobial infection scenarios in Morgellons disease, just like we have polymicrobial infection scenarios in Lyme disease. And we have to uh, try to put these things together. Uh, now, Neil deGrasse Tyson tells us that science is always true, whether you believe it or not. 
and I believe that Dr. Tyson is right on here. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for the world to catch up with science, and there are a lot of disbelievers when science first comes up with a truth, um, and uh, then after a couple of generations, uh, everyone says, well, that's immediately obvious, why did you even doubt it in the first place? We have a hypothesis now to consider. Scientific hypothesis is to come up with an idea and then test it and see if the idea tests through with scientific procedures. This is a pro proposal for linking ticks, bacteria, molecular biology, nanofiber formations, and self-assembly in the macrofibers in Morgellons diseases. So we start with a tick. The tick carries bacteria. The bacteria then produce a molecular biology environment, which then re results in fibers that become bigger and bigger and bigger. They self-assemble into macrofibers and we wind up with Morgellons disease. Tick injures the skin. Tick carries bacteria into the skin, injects them into the skin, and then the molecular events take over and you wind up with a fiber disease. So, and the bacterium necessary, and uh, we know that uh, it is a plant fiberopathy. It, uh, I think, has potential to do the same thing in humans that it does in plants, and that is to make cellulose, and to make cellulose in amounts that can self-polymerize into fibers, and then those fibers become the fibers that you see in Morgellons disease. So where agrobacterium is, or was, cellulose is going to be chemically produced, and the agrobacterium then has to get into the skin. How does it do that? Well, hurdle number one, how does it get into the human dermis epidermis? Well, we propose that the tick bite provides a portal of entry for agrobacterium as well as Borrelia and Lithobacter, Microfilaria, and other co-infections. We know tick bites can produce more than one infection, so tick bites can produce Probesiosis and Borreliosis, or Anaplasmosis, or Ehrlichiosis and Borreliosis. So poly infections and tick bites go together. Now, those are all carried inside the body of the tick. Agrobacterium, I propose, is carried outside the body of the tick. And as the tick harpoon goes through the skin, the bacteria on the outside of the tick gain access to the skin and start to cause trouble. This is also the way he'll go back to the get in, I think. They'll go back to the attaches to the outside of the tick. And then as it goes through, the agrobacterium and the he'll go back to are transmitted into the skin and cause trouble. So here uh, to the left is a dirty tick mouth. And the dirty tick mouth has the go back to pylori and agrobacterium attached to the outside of it. And we have to the right a clean tick mouth. Uh, there's no such thing, I believe, as a clean tick mouth. So uh, I think all tick mouths are dirty. Ticks uh, crawl around, around the ground, agrobacterium, and uh, helicobacter with ground bacteria, fecal bacteria present all over the world. There's no reason why the tick could not be the mechanism for getting these into the skin. Hurdle number two, how does a bacterium injected survive and produce cellulose fibers? Well, agrobacterium here is producing cellulose fibers right now as it is attached, attached to a carrot. And the little uh, purple arrows show the cellulose fibers. And the uh, larger tubular things are the agrobacterium uh, producing the cellulose fibers. Cellulose fibers produce a mesh that holds the bacteria together. And uh, as the fibers are produced in a, in a higher and higher amount, they self-associate and they form the fibrils that you can then see with your naked eye. So that's how I think cellulose fibers are produced in, uh, in the skin by agrobacterium infection. Cellulose fibers, self-assembly, tick transmitted agrobacterium into the skin, and then the agrobacterium biology takes over. Hurdle number three, proof that the DNA of the agrobacterium stays around in the disease Morgellons altered skin. Well, there's a PCR study, yeah, more than one I'm sure, but one that uh, by people that I trust, uh, and I'll show you the pictures so soon, the amplified agrobacterium DNA consistently from Morgellons lesions. The actual intended bacteria need not to be present because the DNA which it transfers to the target cell can remain in the target cell after the bacteria has died or been removed. So the DNA persists after the bug which had it and brought it in may be dead or gone. Uh, hurdle number four, show me a model where agrobacterium produces naked cellulose fibers in living systems without the assistance of additional cellular machinery. 
Well, we've already, pres we've already discussed that. That's the self-assembly, fiberopathy, precursor thing. And it covers both cellulose precursors and amyloid precursors. And I'm sure that other chemicals have self-assembly capability, the whole uh, disease of uh, mad cow disease is a misfolded protein disease and self-assembly of these misfolded proteins into dangerous units which cause cell injury and death. Here we have the self-assembly fiber apathy precursors again, agrobacterium on the left and E. coli with curly fibers of the amyloid type on the right. The fibers come off the surface of the bacteria. If you make enough of them, they produce bigger and bigger fibrils. And then, then, at some point in time, they're deposited in tissue and they cause real disease by taking up space, which shouldn't be taken up uh, by a healthy tissue. Self-assembly of fiber apathy precursors and agrobacterium, cellulose, E. coli type bacteria, amyloid curly fibers. And they undergo self-assembly in the larger and larger fiber units. Show me the actual material machinery by which the microbial cells can produce fibers, which are visible to the human eye without magnification. Well, cellulose fiber self-assembly, amyloid fiber self-assembly, that's the machinery. And I've shown you the pictures already. Uh, so, agrobacterium, uh, in order to have this carry the day, uh, the fibers in Morgellons must be cellulose as a major constituent or cellulose only. Now, I'm willing to allow cellulose plus something else to, so, to co-polymerize and to form the fibers of Morgellons. But cellulose has to be a part of those fibers. And cellulose is not produced by any normal healthy human tissue unless that tissue is acted on by agrobacterial infection. And then the genes for cellulose production is uh, produced uh, uh, from the agrobacterium DNA. And we can thank Dr. Satoski at Stony Brook for that important work and for the work of transfection, which we'll study at the end of this uh, lecture. Here he is. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satoski, very much. And thank you, Dr. Middleveen, Dr. Main, Dr. Stricker, very much for your work and putting up with a lot of uh, angry uh, correspondence from people who don't believe your good work and don't believe the concept of Morgellons disease. Um, Morgellons fibers contain no human DNA. There's no hairball DNA uh, equivalent. Uh, that is what I believe. This hypothesis removes the pilar hair unit from further guilt in Morgellons disease. Uh, alternate pathogenesis for Morgellons disease, part B, if I'm wrong on part A, there's a transfection pathway, and that would be that native mammalian cells are transfected, and then as a result of that, acquiring new DNA from agrobacterium, fiber-initiated events proceed, and cellulose is produced because the genes that are transfected are cellulose genes. Now, in order to get this one going, we have to do not a hurdle, but a pole vault, and uh, the best pole vaulters in the uh, world use uh, carbon fiber, it's fiber, for their uh, uh, pole uh, trajectories. And uh, here we have successful pole vaulters using fiber again to get over the higher, uh, the higher uh, obstacle. Lateral gene transfer, DNA transfers. Uh, these are the uh, things that uh, agrobacterium is known for, uh, helicobacter is known for, Borrelia is known for, they can transfer from one microbe to another parts of their DNA, and then by doing that DNA transfer, they will forever change the DNA of the recipient bacterium in a way that may be good or may be bad for the bacteria. So transfection is this event. Lateral transfer of DNA from one uh, form, virus, bacteria, to another form, either another virus, bacteria, or even a plant cell or a human cell. Dr. Satoski has shown that agrobacterium can transfect human cells. And he did that work, very important work, it's not a work. And so it was the first uh, time when he uh, showed a bacteria could transfer bacterial DNA to human eukaryotic cells. An amazing, amazing event. And uh, that uh, then opens up all these possibilities for us to consider about transfection and DNA transfer, and then the consequences of that. In theory, stem cells of the skin could be altered by lateral DNA transfers, and transfected stem cells could acquire cellular synthesis genes 
and there are four of them, CHVA, CHVB, PSCA, and ATT, all agrobacterium cellulose genes. They could be transfected into stem cells. Now, stem cells can do anything. Stem cells are present in the dermis, they're in the blood, they may be possible targets for transfection by other bacterium, and they look like this under the microscope. They may become any tissue in the body. And if you transfect a stem cell, it could produce cellulose. Uh, from the cellulose genes that arise from agrobacterium transfection. So this is hypothesis B. This has to be further evaluated. It is not proven, but it's a fertile area for thought. So transfected cells would produce cellulose fibers. Um, so my conclusion, Morgellons is a cellulose type fibropathy with associated co-infections, Borrelia and Helicobacter, which may alter the self-assembly of cellulose fibers. And that's how the fibrils come to be. A cellulose fibropathy caused by infection, and the infection is agrobacterium, co-infections, Borrelia, Helicobacter, and then who knows what else, may alter the self-assembly of the cellulose fibrils. But it's an infection, bacterial infection, leading to a cellulose fibropathy, fiber accumulation. Uh, coming back to Dr. Tyson, science is always true, whether you believe it or not. So I'll leave it to you to decide whether you believe any of this or not. Uh, but I, I believe that all of this that I'll talk about is science, and uh, we will see where science leads us. Uh, now we come back to our uh, original uh, stoplight uh, with uh, now all of the squares. Under this uh, synthesis, all of the uh, traffic lights are green in the right-hand corner, and everything is agreed upon, cellulose fiber -alpha. Uh, this is copyrighted uh, by me, the intellectual property. The images are not copyrighted by me. I borrowed them from various sources. And uh, this may not be sold or uh, um, uh, marketed uh, for sale. Uh, it's used as an educa educational tool. And uh, it should be uh, freely available to everybody on the internet. Um, finally, beware of dogmas which limit science, such as the flawed notion that helicobacter pylori can never survive in gastric fluid because Gastric fluid has a pH of 4, and that can digest razor blades. That's what they told Barry Marshall and Robin Warren. The helicobacter pylori could never live in the gas uh, arena. And of course, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Drs. Marshall and Warren because they didn't believe that it was impossible for helicobacter pylori to survive in the pH of 4 in the gastric uh, arena. And uh, uh, the rest uh, has been. Uh, self-evident, uh, the, the huge explosion of knowledge uh, based on rejection of a flawed dogma uh, that uh, how could it be that uh, something could survive an acid? And how could it be that that uh, could survive long enough to cross the seeds? Well, it does and it did and it shall be. Thank you very much for your kind attention and um, we uh, send our best regards. My wife and I and the spirits of our dogs pass now. Uh, Travis in the center and Tyler. Uh, we also thank you for your kind attention. And uh, remember that uh, we used to be New Yorkers, you know, looking forward to New Yorkers view the world this way. That, uh, everything important happens in Manhattan Island and uh, the rest of the world is Jersey, Kansas, the Pacific Ocean and uh, things off in the distance that really don't matter. Uh, that, uh, that idea, of course, is just a parody. New Yorkers are aware of important things that happen around the world, and uh, Argellans is one of those important things. So uh, thank you again for your attention, and uh, request uh, for references. We're happy to respond to them.